All right. Well, I am going to go ahead and start because we do record this. So I don't want too much dead time up front. And uh, we will get our speaker on as we're going through our introductions here. So I am Sherry Nadine. I am the owner of Collegiate Sports Advocate. And I had uh, started this space, you know, this is about my year mark into it. We've come, uh, I went with a different podcast group before, so I didn't have them saved, but I started doing them again in fall with different topics. And so they are saved on our Collegiate Sports Advocate page under media, and they're saved by date and everything. So you can find all of our podcasts, you can find our Twitter lives, but I see some of the same familiar faces. So I thank you for joining in. And I love learners. So my background, I am a 28-year retired telecom manager. I have a bachelor's in management, uh, a Bachelor of Science in Management, and then a minor in marketing. Go figure. Uh, So it's something I've loved to do all of my life. And I also owned a headhunting recruiting firm in the telecom industry. So uh, this is a natural thing for me to be doing uh, recruiting. And I've been doing it almost 10 years. And we have, uh, where are my numbers today? We have uh, 716 or yeah, hold on here. I got to give you my number so I'm accurate. I had it up on my screen and then I put it away. Uh, we are uh, 475 committed student athletes. We currently are working with 916. So um, Jackie is still trying to get our other speaker on. So I'm going to switch it to Jen Henson and introduce you, Jen. And I'd love to hear your background and uh Uh, your education and how you're doing what you're doing today. Okay, thanks, Sherry. So my name is Jen Henson, and my uh, path to uh, being a test prep professional uh, was definitely not one that I expected, but I I was a student-athlete, um, from when I was in middle school all the way through uh, my college experience of playing tennis at Division I Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, academics were always really important to me. <clears throat> um, and I was actually at Xavier with an academic scholarship and walked on to the tennis team. They they did not actively recruit me. Some other schools did that were not um, a good fit. And um, so I walked in, I walked on to that team and um, became, um, upon graduation, a high school English teacher. And after um, 22 years of teaching high school, I decided to dedicate uh, myself uh, full time to test prep. So I meet with students during the school day, after school, um, all different times. And I love working with athletes um, because they understand the importance of practice. And um, so that's how I got into test prep and um, just started working with athletes at the schools where I taught. And it's just become a full time passion of mine. How long have you been doing it? Because I know you and I have been partners for, oh gosh, I want to say eight years or so. Yes, I've been in test prep for 12 years. 12 years. Yep. And any idea how many student athletes you've helped along the I way? I don't know. I would have to sit down and um, look at the numbers, but I know I've helped thousands of students um, just because I also go to schools and work with their whole uh, junior class and things. But I don't, I don't have an accurate number. I know you and I've always <laughs> joked about it because I, I just refer my student athletes and you give them a nice discount because we have such a great handshake of camaraderie of how our programs are pretty similar in, in our passion about caring about what the student athletes do. So Jackie, I'm not sure if you're ready to introduce yourself. Would love to hear your background, your education and what you do. Sure, absolutely. So I'm Jackie Wins. Uh, I am a former t- a dual sport athlete, NCAA Division II um, in soccer and lacrosse. I'm highly invested in collegiate softball in regards to the fan side. Clearly, based on my picture, I'm an OU fan, love or hate it. Um, but I'm really involved um, in that aspect and wanting to see the game grow. But also because of my background as a teacher as well. Um, and really invested in the recruiting cycle and just working with student athletes all over the country. Thank you, Jackie. I know you're uh, 
fiercely working with our speaker who is listening. I think we're having trouble getting her on the app. So I'm going to continue on and then um, Jackie will continue to help in the background because she's the smart one in this bunch here. But she is Dr. Jackie now. You forgot to say that part, Jackie. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you. Excellent. It was a recent accomplishment. So I admire that. So the reason we chose this topic is the NCAA ruled in January of 2023 that Division One and Two adopted legislation legislation to remove standardized test scores from initial eligibility requirements for all student athletes who initially enroll full time on or after August 1st, 2023. So check with your NCAA school you plan to attend regularly whether standardized test scores are necessary for admission or scholarship requirements. So it does have a click for more information, click here, and that is on NCAA's um, site. So I think it's important that you understand that this is not across the board. It's not a 100% waived. I think one of the issues is that when they make a statement like that, a lot of people grab on to what might be easy or what might be uh, convenient, but may not understand the repercussions for not doing everything possible to go out and be the best, you know, educated, uh, uh, prepared to enter the academic environment. And I have always been a testing fan and I, I get hit up pretty hard up on the chat boards about uh, some people aren't good test takers. I would tell you I'm probably not a great test taker, but I've never, um, you know, used that as an excuse to not try harder or work harder. I just know there's some places I academically couldn't couldn't exist. So I see our speaker in here. So I'm going to invite you to speak here, Amy, because I do want to get um, your background and your education and understand why we invited you because she's a very important person. So as soon as I see that um, I sent that to her. It's the bottom left. It says request to speak. And when she enters, I'll let you do that, Jackie. So one of the things we've seen in doing the research here is the NCAA kind of listens to the, you know, what they need to do to help the student athletes be student athletes. And so a lot of this is coming from football and basketball. They push a lot of the the issues and a lot of it has more to do with their athletics than it does the actual academics. And so I want to switch that around and say that we're always going to be in favor of doing what's best in your academic pursuit, because we do believe that this is the most important thing long-term. And we always say 40 years. So other comments that I saw NCAA make is they're shifting away. It doesn't mean it's gone forever. And I know we deal with so many of the younger student athletes. We don't want you to get away from the testing. It doesn't hurt you to test. It's not anything that's not going to be comfortable for you. It's just important for you to keep on that track. So Amy, I see you in here now on the bottom left is your mute button. If you want to come off and introduce yourself and your background and tell us a little bit more about your passion for being on the call here tonight. Okay. Hi, I'm Amy Axon. I am a literacy specialist for Boyd ISD. I have been teaching for 20 years. I have two masters, one in ESL and one is a literacy specialist. I've taught in three states, five different schools. So I have some background in what it's like to be in public schools. I've taught in, right now I'm teaching in a school with K-12, 1,500, but I've also taught in a school that was 6A with 17,000 students. So I have a wider range of uh, public school knowledge. Excellent. And what we introduced so far is just, you know, the shifting away that the NCAA is doing. But what we're cautioning our student athletes is to not shift away from it. So some of the language I saw in doing the research is there um, some schools don't waive it. So NCAA might say, hey, we're not interested in in uh, requiring the testing, but we're going to require it to enter our school. So some of it was saying that some schools will require it for scholarships. So ladies and gentlemen that are in baseball and softball, when you have 12 scholarships for athletics, you're going to be looking for academic scholarships. So um, Jackie or Jen or Amy, anytime you want to speak, you just come off your, your mic and I will recognize it and let you comment. So if you have any thoughts to those um, points that I've made so far, feel free to come on. Well, uh, one comment that I, I would like to make, Sherry, is <clears throat> you and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. 
I've been in the test prep world and the test prep space for 12 years now and started with a student athlete, a young man who was a football player, and um, he could not meet NCAA eligibility, which was a a, a minimum score, um, an equation, if you will, that students had to meet with GPA, and then a test score um to match the GPA or to go with the GPA. The lower your GPA, the higher your test score had to be and vice versa. So over the course of 12 years, I've only worked with three students total that could not meet NCAA eligibility minimums. Three. The other thousands of students were all trying to raise their scores for other reasons scholarships, um, minimums that they needed for programs um, such as nursing majors or um, STEM, a lot of STEM programs will require a higher score or just admissions to get into a school, et cetera, et cetera. So I think when we talk about that eligibility score that was needed that they're dropping, it, it really only affected a few students in terms of students who couldn't make that minimum on their own. And I think that's important to understand. That's great. And one tag on to that is what I want to make sure that they get is not to avoid the testing. I'm afraid this message will go out and the student athletes will avoid taking the test to be prepared to actually you know, need it. And don't be so afraid of it, right? If you're saying only three in your thousands have ever you know, been at risk of not meeting it, then you know, try not to avoid it. I see a lot of student athletes avoid taking it now because you know, they don't have all the curriculum uh, uh, yet to you know, get into the schools that need to get into. But we take it early and often in female athletics because we've got issues where college coaches won't engage in recruiting you if you don't have, if you're not tracking towards the right thing. It was Dartmouth last year. They said, look, if you're not tracking to be able to get into our school, um, you know, and we know you're going to get a lower score, scores freshmen and sophomores because you don't have all the curriculum, then, you know, we're probably not going to spend our time recruiting you because there are people who have the talent and the academic match. So we try to fine tune that and, and zero in and tune in on those candidates. So some of that is, is pre-selection on our side. I just want to make sure the message is, hey, keep taking it, keep working towards your academics just because they're not waiving it. So Amy or Jackie, any thoughts? I mean, overall, you want to set yourself up for success. I think when you limit yourself and you just shy away from doing something, it also adds a little bit of a question mark. Remember that this is new. So you're going to have coaches who have a way of doing things or they want things. And if you just shy away from taking things and you don't have that on the docket, um, you know, you don't know what other questions may be asked. Um, is it, do you not take it, you know, because you, you won't score well, what are the, why is there that empty space? So until, you know, we've been through this for a while and we see some aspect of change, maybe, uh, I would stay towards, um, you know, doing whatever you can, uh, to compete for any type of scholarship or even entrance to the school. Amy, what is your experience there? Well, uh, I played ball, uh, D2. A long time ago, I did not go on a, on a athletic scholarship. I went on an academic scholarship. I was more desirable, according to the coach, because she had limited scholarships and was able to give me a, a spot on the team because I had an academic scholarship. I do know that a lot of uh, schools do not give you 100% on your athletic scholarships. So you will have to look at academic scholarships unless you can financially support it. Or you're going to have to take loans, which will take your parents to co-sign because you're 18. So any of those scenarios is going to probably require you to start looking academically, not just at GPA, because that gets you limited scholarships. You're going to have to look at more, um, the test scores get you the bigger scholarships. Certain, And also the 10%, the top 10% of your class will get most of Texas paid for. And looking at that, a lot of schools will be more willing to look at you if you they give you a forty percent of that of the academic or the athletic scholarship. Where are you going to get the other sixty percent? 
Boy, you just hit some key words here for these athletes. And you need to understand that, you know, with 12 scholarships in softball and baseball, and you've got a roster 25, I mean, that's almost a bare minimum now. That's half. Uh, Where's the rest of the money coming from? And you are more desirable if you bring more to the table. I always call it a value match, right? So if they're going to recruit you, what are you going to bring to the table? One, you got to be able to play at that level, even as a walk-on. Um, and we don't have a lot of walk-ons because they'll give you a little bit of money so that you can sign and be scholarshiped. But when you bring a lot to the table academically, one, they, didn't, they know they don't have to worry about you uh, meeting the requirements to stay eligible when you get there. So that's another thing that they're not mentioning here is when you get to school, it's not test requirement, but man, I've heard of a kid already flunking out of a major university. Now, luckily, she's not a CSA kid, but it happens first semester you can be put on academic probation and then what? So they look at the GPA, they look at your uh, test score to see how hard you're working and if you have the discipline to actually make it academically. Uh, any thoughts there, Jen? I really think that this uh, narrative that you sometimes hear about, um, oh my gosh, but I just am not, I don't test well. You know, I really ask students to reflect on, are they, are they really not testing well across the board? Um, You might not test well the first time you take an ACT test, because maybe you just don't know what to expect, or you don't know how to approach the different sections. But just like the first time you drive or the first time you go to pitch a softball or hit a softball, where you start isn't where you are going to end with a little work. So I think that, you know, your first score is not your final score or the one that you have to even tell coaches about, but at least, as you said, test early, test often, at least by trying one and not putting it off, you know where you stand. Um, And, you know, so many times, that score can be a leading thing for a correspondence with the coach, you know, because, because truly if it comes down to two, you know, equal players, the one that the coach doesn't have to babysit academically is probably going to win that, you know, tug of war, so to speak. Totally. You hit the nail on the head on that one, Jen. Thank you. And I do want to remind you guys, because we have some of our same listeners. I appreciate your attention. But there are some emojis down at the bottom. So if you want to clap or give her uh, any of the speakers some, you know, su- uh, support while they're talking and, and applaud to it. And then also, um, we don't have any D1 coaches on our panel tonight. So you're welcome if you have something to add to request to be a speaker, uh, because we do like the interaction. Or you can actually go up to uh, uh, this Twitter uh, account and, and put a question up there, or you can private message to Jackie or myself. Jackie's our co-host there. I've got my um, Twitter uh, DM open, so you're welcome to do that. But we love the questions. We love all of the interactions. So I had a question out to the panel, and I'll let whoever wants to answer it. Will this, um, you know, taking away or not requiring, will it lessen the value of an elite education at an institution? Well, a lot of the Ivy League type schools or the Dukes or the the um, Notre Dames and stuff, they live off of prestige. And prestige requires low acceptance rates, which are very hard to get in acceptance rates, and high graduation rates. Uh, they also re- usually want high ACT or SAT scores because those students are more likely they know can make it through their program. Plus, that's part of that high enrollment rate. You want something that is elite, not just athletic, but they want academic. They're looking at academic elites. One thing I can say about uh, education, my years, my mom's a retired teacher. My dad's a retired professor. Been in, you know, this for 50 years. Like uh, everything comes around, goes around in education. Anybody's in education on the panel will tell you this. What is accepted today 10 years may not, or five years may not. And what they're doing today will change. It always, education's changing every year. Something's new 
and news up or around. So just because they are wavering ACTs or ACTs does not mean that's what they're going to do in four years or five years. It's always changing. Anybody else want to tag onto that? And, and welcome, Mike. I accepted you as a speaker. You're a regular speaker on our show. <laughs> so I was just going to tackle a little bit. Um, being literally around five miles or so from Princeton, um, it academics is is important, right? But well-roundedness is also um, something to keep in mind, right? Um, in the aspect of, you know, listen, you're playing your sports, you're doing your academics, but also how are you enriching yourself? Right. Like there, there is a whole aspect to an application and depending on where you apply, that might be important. Right. Um, so think about that as well. Things that you enjoy, things outside of softball, not just also for academics, but wellness. Excellent. All right. So a couple other questions um, and feel free again, audience, if you want to ask any specific questions, let me know. But um I think Jen already covered this or Amy, my question was, does it make you more desirable or less desirable? So I think we covered that in our conversation of, man, it, you know, there's, uh, you know, a, a reason why they want you when you have high academics, if you can play at their institution. So I think that's great. Um, my concern always is there's, you know, a West Coast school that said, hey, the whole UC system is waiving SAT and ACTs. But one of our kids already had a test score that was so drastically off, like in the teens. And this, you know, the UC system used to be in the 30s as a requirement to actually academically exist. I have a sister who graduated from UC San Diego and um, uh, a sister-in-law with um Berkeley. And I mean, it just goes on. I know what the requirements are. Those are high academic institutions. And this particular coach was saying, no, no, we can waive it and we'll bring them on. And I'm thinking, what is it actually going to do to this kid in the classroom? The kind of stress that it's going to bring on, you can't tutor that kind and bridge that kind of gap. It's going to be way off. And they're like, well, the GPA is so high, you know, we're willing to take a risk. And this is when Amy and I started chatting and getting to know each other. I said, how is that even possible? So, Amy, I would love to hand it to you and talk about the GPAs, especially in the state of Texas. Yeah, in the state of Texas, uh, I will say GPAs, how do I say this? I have a lot of 4.0s that cannot meet or uh, cannot meet. I'm not even talking about approach, cannot meet on the star testing. They could be poor testers, but there's a large percentage. So it is an awkward percentage. You have poor testers, but when you put the ratio of poor testers versus 4.0 or 3.8 GPAs, there is a discrepancy there. Um, One thing with GPAs is retest, uh, test corrections, tutorials, when you start getting into college, those are less likely. So you're getting used to in high school or middle school or whatever, you're getting used to, I failed this test, I get to retake it. I get to do tutorials and get extra credit. I can get extra credit. I can do test corrections and get it up to you know a B or whatever. That's not necessarily. So when I get students in high school, I see them struggling in dual credits where high, colleges don't tend to do that as well. And I mean, and our dual credit is either with Texas Tech or Weatherford. And students that had 4.0, all of a sudden, they're struggling to get a C at a dual credit. That's because GPAs are a lot different when you can test correct, um, retest, or tutorials. Jen, do you have anything to add to this? I do. I um since I work with students nationwide, um, thank goodness, due to Zoom and FaceTime, you know, my students live from coast to coast. Um, I see that a lot, the same discrepancy between GPA and test scores. And so what is a fact, um, and it is documented, and there's research, and, um, you know, GPAs are inflated right now. Um, and so parents are often quite upset because the test score doesn't match a GPA when really the, the test score might be a more accurate reflection of, of where that student is right now on the test and when it's testing. So I think that, 
um, I, I don't think that these tests are going away. In fact, um, because I, I read a lot of the articles and I watch the national trends, there are already schools that <clears throat> had used the descriptor test optional that are bringing them back. And they're saying it's not an option. We had students um, enroll and, and they were not successful. And, you know, colleges really don't want that either. Colleges want you there. Uh, they they want, well, they want your money. There's one, but, you know, they do want you to do well. They want you to stay at their university. It doesn't, it doesn't benefit them at all for you to, to not do well. So th- some major players um, in the academic world are bringing those scores back. So, um, and I think that that is, you know, except for the NCAA is not requiring them for initial eligibility, the schools are going to be using them more than ever. And that's what I saw. I I called around. I had a couple uh, college coaches lined up to come on tonight, but they had some conflicts. But everybody I talked to, Ivy League, Division II, Division I, I always try to call five in each category. And they all said, look, we're going to blink at it. We're going to look, but, um, you know, we're not going to waive it. It's actually going to be an excuse to not pick a student athlete because they want the insurance that that kid is going to make it and that they, you know, are going to stay academic eligible. And then one coach said it eliminates the stress of the bridge. I mean, it's already a big challenge to go from high school to college and then the amount of expectations athletically and now the expectation academically. And now you're, you're not able to be bridged academically to compete in the classroom. The, the stress and the pressure is, is off the chart. So uh, that's when they see a lot of quitting. They see a lot of getting cut. Boys baseball is ruthless. They barely make it the first semester unless they're just cooking on all cylinders. Uh, The girls softball might get you into the first season as a freshman, but man, if you're not a a big time starting player. And um, the other thing, when my daughter was going through the evaluation, I won't name the school, but one of them said, oh, no, no, you don't need to study nutrition. That's going to be pre-med and division one. You know, I got to have you on the field certain times of days. I can't have you in a lab. Um, you know, so some of the medical undergraduate degrees that require those kind of labs and clinics, you know, that just doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, my daughter's like, well, I'm not dumb. And I'm like, no, but what they're saying is you're not going to exist in the classroom with that major. So they change your major. So a lot of times these kids go in, oh, I want to be a nurse. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a physical therapist. But they, they you know, have a, an under 20 ACT. They're not getting into the type of college athletically or academically with that major. And then now that I've seen over, you know, almost a thousand student athletes, they don't stick with the um, degree they want when they go in if they're academically not going to exist with it. So any thoughts, panel? I was just going to say, it's hard to sort of, when you're in high school, especially conceptualize that you, it's not just you, like in Texas, right? You're competing against you and athletes from like New Jersey, California. Um, And so there is a lot that goes into it um, and to think about. And that's why it's so important when you have, when you're in school, right? To continue to do the things that are, that, it's not just what people are doing in Texas, but around the country. Um, And that recruiting doesn't just stop there. Uh, So just keep in your mind that there's a lot that goes on into it. Uh, Don't overstress yourself, but know that it's, you know, you are, you know, one fish in a large pond um, and that to ensure that you put yourself in the best direction that you can. Sort of like what I was saying earlier, don't limit yourself by not taking tests, things like that. Um, And also don't just be like everybody else. Oh, I'm going to take three study halls. That's going to be a question, right? Like, why are you doing that? Uh, you know, what are, what else are you doing um, to ensure that everything is going well uh, for your grades? And how are you challenging yourself um, to ensure that the scholarship opportunities are available? And, you know, one thing right now <clears throat> to piggyback on what Jackie just said, um, you know, you're making decisions as a high schooler and you really maybe don't, and that's okay to not know what you want to do in the future. Right now I have a 37 year old student, 37 years old who needs a score. 
um, on the ACT for a, a major, a program that she wants to go to in college. And they will not accept her into the program. She's in the university, but it's a medical program, medical field. Um, and she is working to raise her ACT score. So it's easier to do it now. Um, no, it's not necessarily fun to raise, although I do make it fun and others can make it a lot of fun. It's maybe not what you want to be doing, but it's easier to do it now than when you're 37 with two children. Bless her heart. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right on. I think sometimes it's just the structure and the compartmentalized approach to doing the things you need to do in a timely way. Everybody knows that we teach a time management program and that uh, I'm a checklist person and, you know, we have a system and that's because that's what it takes to get all that you need to do done and actually be successful in the classroom and not pile on the misfit academically. So we're looking for an athletic fit and we're looking for an academic fit. And, you know, that's why we test early and often. So if you test early and often, you have an idea of what's coming up. You have an idea of what you need to know. If you're not in Calc, A, B, whatever it is, you're not going to score perfect on the math. Everybody knows that. But it also helps you understand what you need to know in order to get to some of those institutions. So as young prospective student athletes, you now can kind of start to shift lanes on the highway of, you know, your journey to college. So that's what we try to do here at CSA. Um, Jackie or Jen or Amy, any thoughts? I was just going to say, like, also identify the fact that this is kids from every state. Like in New Jersey is the top three testing state. Okay. I'm telling you, my athletes are doing the same things. They're literally worrying about what they're taking. You know, it, 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 does their whole profile look, you know, perfect, you know, so that they can do the best they can. Um, so it doesn't matter. Don't be like, oh, well, I'm from, you know, I don't know, Iowa. And so I don't know how my profile will look. Don't worry about that. Just worry about you as an individual doing the best you possibly can. And at the end of the day, knowing that you did your best and you tried to do as much as you possibly could, right, then that will put you in the best possible opportunity for yourself. Um, don't try to overextend yourself and not and fail all your classes. Oh, I'm going to take five APs next year and then fail three, right? You need to understand what your best is to be able to push and challenge, right? But not overwhelm. You just brought up an interesting point that I get asked a lot is should they be taking AP courses and whatnot? And I use our son as an example. He aced the math section on the SAT, he, you know, 31 ACT on his first try. But by golly, his English was rough. And when they said AP Euro, and it was one of his required classes in high school, we were like, why? The guy's a math guy. He's a robotics guy. He's, you know, not going to do well. Why force him to do something AP wise that wasn't going to be the right fit for him, right? So he just took regular standard English. And it was honestly the best thing we did for him. Any uh, recommendations or thoughts about that, Amy? Well, um, so again, that, that's a tricky situation. So like I said, in the state of Texas, top percent, 10% in the class, GPA wise, um, load up, I uh, get the majority of the scholarships. With that being said, um, if you take all regular classes and you get a 4.0 and somebody else takes APA, the APs or even the dual credits and gets Bs and stuff, even though they're weighted and stuff, uh, like last year, I watched at our school, the valedictorian, the salutatorian didn't understand, or family did not understand why the valedictorian got it and she didn't because she took all the APs, all the dual credits. I mean, she went above and beyond, but her GPA wasn't as good as the valedictorian who may have not took, taken exactly what that girl, she may have took a, a regular something somewhere that got an A versus this girl taking the dual credit and got a B. Uh, so you got to be very tricky there with when you start talking about um, APs or dual credit or on ramp, they all are little, they also are weighted, but so if you can get an A an A in AP, that's actually over a 4.0, but if you are not an A, but a, a five, but if you get, uh, a two or something, well, that's not weighted enough. 
And same thing with dual credit and on ramps. So, but for most of your valedictorians or your top 10%, they're going to load with APs, dual credits, or on ramps because the more you have for that application for scholarships, the better chance you will get that scholarship. I just have a quick question for either Amy, Jen, uh, whoever would like to respond or has experience with this, but um, I actually don't know this. Do weights change based on states and schools or is it pretty much the same with APs? Oh, GPA at one school is not GPA at another school. That's a great question. So when colleges and universities are looking to compare to students, and if we just said, you know, here's Jane Smith and she has a 4.5 and here's Sally Smith and she has a 4.5 and they're from two different schools, that you cannot compare those to GPAs. Really, even honestly, within a school, comparing um, like a grade point average, even with teachers who are next door to each other. May, may not be accurate, right? Um, so when we talk about like a, a, you know, well, I have an A in this person's English class and I have an A in this person's English class, those two A's can be different. Now, I felt like in the state of Texas, it was a lot more uniform um, in terms of in my 10th grade team, <clears throat> I taught here in Texas for two years. So 20 of my years were in Ohio and Kentucky combined, two were here in Texas. My grades were the same. My assignments and the things I graded were the same as all of the teachers on my 10th grade team. But that was never the case when I was in any other state. So it's it's so hard to compare students like that because weights and, you know, um, scales. So in, in one one school, a 90 to 100 could be an A, but in another school could be 95 to 100. And and then where does that bump come if they're taking an AP? It's so hard to do that. But the ACT test is the ACT and the SAT is the SAT. And you can definitely compare those because they are taking the same test no matter where they're located. But that was a, that's a great question. Amy, did you want to add anything with your experience in teaching? Yeah, I mean, she was absolutely right. Uh, being from three different states, and so GPAs are very different too. Some people can have a four point two, four point five GPA, but some schools they're nothing above a four point oh. Even with the weighted, it is a four point oh. That is your max. But then somebody else and from another state can have a four point five because of all the weighted APs and stuff, taking the exact same thing. So like. Certain schools in Arkansas, when I was teaching there, 4.0 is max. You cannot get a 4.5. You cannot get all these up, upper numbers. Here in Texas, you can get a 4.5 because of the weights. It's just a little bit different from state to state. So looking at student from state to state is going to be different. I was just going to add, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty ignorant to just New Jersey and the educational aspects, so feel free if it's different. But I know that um, our schools, our guidance counselors, things like that, um, do have to send a school profile in. So while you think you may be sending in a wonderful, let's say, 4.4, right, they will look at it in their system and they will be able to tell, uh, you know, sort of the inflation of it. Uh, so like I said, you know, earlier, it's important that you do your best, but understand that, you know, don't just say, oh, well, I have a 4.5 because maybe somebody else has a 4.0 from a different state with different scores. And it's seen as better based on who knows, rigor, test scores and whatnot. Um, so important to understand that they usually do get a profile. And we have a question from the audience. And again, if you have any questions, you're welcome to add it to the Twitter space or, or DM us. Um, personally, but it says, does dual credit help you towards college credit and do they affect your eligibility to play in college? So I'm going to answer it from a college recruiting perspective and then I'll let our educators answer it. So the challenge with that is sometimes you come in with too many credits to where it eliminates the junior college route. So in today's competitive environment with only 8,000 student athletes out of 
375,000 approximate registered high school softball players. Uh, I did the math uh, last week on it. It's 0 .01, 0 0.0197 chance you'll play Division One softball. And then, you know, 1% of that is the ones, you know, are playing at the, at the big time, big name schools. So the odds are really against you. If you are dead set on making that your route, then the other route to getting there is going through the JUCO system, which I'm a big fan of. I love it because they're some of the best trainers. They have double the games played. They promote you out. It's, it's another chance to get back into the level that maybe you were a late bloomer or had an injury or you just wanted to be a more polished, uh, you know, physical athlete. You go two years junior college and transfer in. A lot of coaches say they would rather pick a junior coming in in a transfer situation than they would a freshman because they've had more college game experience, they're more talented, they're better trained, and they're uh, an instant value to be able to come in and be an impact player on the roster. So I'm a big fan of that route. And so your dual credit takes you out of that opportunity or gives you less time to play there. So I'll uh, pass it to the educators. So I'm sorry. So uh, dual credit, so I'm looking at from the academic side, not the athletic side. Um, so for students, on-ramp is cheaper than dual credit. Uh, dual credit is great for college and it's great for applications. It's great for college applications, especially if you do well in them. Now, if you don't do well in them, well, that, that will hurt you. And that you definitely don't want to go into college failing a dual credit. Dual credit, you get what you get, or you get you can get the school grade and the college grade. So you can get two different grades with dual credit. So why it's called dual credit on ramp, you get the college grade. So if you get if you fail an on ramp, you fail in class and you fail at college. The great thing about on ramps, it's half as much as a dual credit. So if you're looking at money wise, because like I said, when I advise students. I'm looking at their financial statement, how they, what they can afford and what they can. We also, most schools have, I don't, it's kind of like scholarships, but they have support and help within the school through the community and stuff where they help them with on-ramp or door credit, helping them pay or take a percentage off of it based on income. But with that being said, on dual credit, you can get two grades. You will get the college grade and you will get a classroom grade. You could get a B in your classroom and get a C in the college in the college grade, and still that's what you're going to go into college with. You're going to go in with a C to Comp One, uh, but your GPA at high school is going to be a little bit better. Again, on ramp, you get a D in on ramp. You get a D in high school. You get a D in college, and when you go in, let's say you're taking Comp One, which is English, you're going into college. You're going in with a fail already which you're going to have to make up. And I'm just saying, but for me, as far as advising students, depending on what they can do, their ability and their financial situation. And let's say if you want to be a doctor, I'm not saying any, these, you know, athletes, you know, you be careful on that, but you want to go to MD school. You can get two years out with dual credit on ramp in high school so it won't be eight years when you get out of school. You'll have six years left. So that's something to look at. What is your future goal? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to do, play softball and, you know, make World Series and, you know, be on the field 24 hours? Or are you looking at this all ends? Because I play ball. It all ends. I can tell you right here. It all ends. What are you going to do after it? That's what you need to think about. You don't need to think about World Series getting a ring you need to think about this all ends because it didn't all end for them too jen did you want to add to that when i take a step back and think about this from an educator perspective um and remember that I have, um, I had 22 years in the classroom, so I saw a lot of different situations. But when I was advising my own children about AP versus dual credit versus, you know, just advanced classes or whatever, I didn't want to cause them or put stress on them that I had seen so many of my students go through 
Um, both of my own children are also student athletes. Uh, both plan to, um, you know, play at the collegiate level. So I wanted them to be balanced. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that when you're trying to decide your schedule that um, if you handle the AP classes and you can handle multiple AP classes and, and there are students certainly who can, then great, that's awesome. Um, if it is just going to be so beyond stressful for you and um, it's going to hurt your mental health, then I just don't think it's, it's worth it. Um, I think balancing things out, you know, my own children take a couple of those and then I've got some dual credit and then, oh, I have a really fun class that I take as well because I think that they need a break in the day. So uh, I think it's all, as with anything in life, it's all about balance. And I think that students need to keep that in perspective um, when they're when they're making their own schedule. And for some, that means I can do six APs because that's very easy for me. That students though that's not going to be the case excellent and i think we're nearing our time so i want to remind our audience if you haven't friended our guest speakers here today uh jen henson is fabulous been a partner for i think eight years now with csa and we refer all of our testing there um amy an amazing educator and amazing mom of an up-and-coming fabulous student athlete and of course, our co-host Jackie, who is uh, my partner in crime, she's just fabulous, and I love everything she does. But I want to summarize and give you a couple tips. Do go to the NCAA site that talks about the test scores. Read it yourself. Listen to the language that they're saying. That it's um, you know that it the schools are going to require what they require. So my advice is going to be always go forward take the tests, don't avoid them, you know, study, practice, learn, uh, the more you can learn and be an, an actual seeker of knowledge, I think the better you're going to do in college, no matter uh, what level or layer, it'll also help you find the better fit for you so that you'll have success when you get there. I also want to indicate to you, there is a map that we use in our presentation for CSA that is a map of the states and it shows the scores of all the states. And that's why, you know, I get very uh, uh, passionate about um, the Texas scores because I raised my kids a majority of their time in California and it was just a different learning environment and, you know, the, just the different way that everybody does it across the country. But I think it'll give you a little bit of an eye test for what part of the country you're in and, you know, a little bit of a, a warning of what you need to do and, and to do some extra to make sure that you don't get behind academically and then aren't eligible for some of the schools that you would like to play in. So any final thoughts, Jackie? Forgive me if for, if for some reason it wasn't clicking off. Um, overall, you know, you what's beautiful about this journey is that you get to set it and you have a conversation with yourself and you determine what your goals are. And if your goal is to play collegiate softball of any level, right, it is up to you to determine what you need to do and how to challenge yourself and what you are up for. Um, and that is the best aspect of it all. Uh, because this is going to be your first time where you are starting to understand what it feels like to be a student athlete, right? Can you time manage it, right? Can you, you know, make sure that you can pass the classes and get great scores, right? Can you do all of these things? And that's what it's like being a collegiate athlete. Um, so if you are not up for that challenge, right, then you have to readjust your goals, right, to whatever that is. Um, but if you are somebody who's ready for it, then don't let anything stop you. Excellent. And Jen, how do they find you? Can you give us your website and your contact information so student athletes can find you to hopefully get some uh, early tutoring? My website is www.jenhensonactprep.com. Um, so I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, you can also... The best way for if parents want to follow me, um, I have I have a Facebook page 
so not my profile. My profile is at its friend limit, which is so silly, um, you know, that we have to limit our friends. But um, my Facebook page is Jen Henson ACT Prep. And on that page, I post tips, I post deadlines, I post, um, oh, information classes that I'm doing and I'm putting that in the chat as well so um but anyway I would I would be happy and honored to to talk with your families or even just email them recommendations guide them in this process excellent and remember if you are a CSA student athlete she does give you a little discount and incentive um, because we do such um, phenomenal work together so uh, Amy any parting thoughts uh, I would just say, do your, do your best, be your best, and it will work out for you. Excellent. Well, once again, I thank you guys. But next week, are you dying to hear what's next week? So we go. are going, <laughs> I know, go, yes. So next week, we are going to have some guest speakers on the metrics and the combines and the measurements, which is, you know, been around in football forever. I even watched that show. I love seeing those guys run their testing and their combines. And it's become very, very big in baseball. And it's been creeping up on us for several years here in softball to where I think a lot of the schools are using it as, as a basis of what you're coming in with and what you can work on. So uh, we are also going to have an Iowa State assistant coach on it, and it should have a pitching matrix guy. And it is the ODM, which is uh, on deck um, that we've known for, gosh, probably 20 years now in the sport. So it's a good lineup. And then the week after, I'm throwing a new one out for you guys. I'm going to invite current parents in college because I've had a bunch of them this year saying, hey, I've learned so much in the recruiting process. I'd like to share what I've learned and give some helpful hints to the prospective student athlete audience out here for what they wish they would have done or listened. I had one say, I wish I would have listened to you earlier. So uh, they're going to all come in and give you their confessionals, but I thought that would be a fun one too. So that will be uh, next week, by the way, is my birthday. So the testing one we're doing on my birthday. And so you can all come be part of my birthday celebration. And then the 27th it will be the one with the parents. And then I'm always open to other topics these are being recruited. They're up on our media page on Collegiate Sports Advocate. And you can go and see all of our podcasts, all of our Twitter lives, and all the content that we put out there. And to keep celebrating all of our commitments, we had a um, East Texas Baptist recently, and we had a Arkansas Rich Mountain um, just a couple days ago. So uh, we keep rolling them out, and we thank you guys again for listening, and we wish you a happy week, and thank you to our speakers. You guys were fabulous. Have a great night.